if we're lucky enough to see the star wobble because the planet's moving in a plane where we can see the star move left to right or up and down, that's one thing. If we're lucky enough to see the planet cross across the face of the star and actually diminish the light of the star a little bit, we can measure that. But if the planet's anywhere else around, up and down, or the planet's moving further away and then back closer to Earth, we're not going to see that planet. That's why Kepler was launched in the first place. And sure enough, we've discovered like 250 planets since Kepler was launched. That perturbation theory is exactly this, the, the extension of this eccentricity of this orbit. To put it simply, when a 747 hits a fly, the physics of it is the fly hits the 747 with the same amount of force that the 747 hits the fly. Mm. So as Ellen is traveling through our solar system along the plane of the other planets in the solar system, it is affecting each planet as it goes through the solar system, and each planet is affecting the trajectory of Ellen. And so these calculations are almost impossible to make. We can make some predictions, but as the data is coming back, we're learning about the real mass of Elenin, the real speed of Elenin, and what the mass and speed are doing to the other planets in our solar system. And it's really unpredictable. Quite right, to, and to just the, so. To the degree that we can tell where it's going to go. Quite right, quite right. Folks, at, uh, at 40 minutes after the hour, you're listening to the Crimson Pill radio program with Antonin Fiore as your host. We are joined, our featured guest today is Dr. Brooks Agnew, and we've launched into our discussion of Comet Elenin and uh, some very, very interesting things about this comet that make it uh, uh, rather unique, uh, something that we haven't quite seen, not the normal critter. Uh, we've been talking most recently about its orbital eccentricity. And uh, just to kind of re reframe that notion, the greater the orbital eccentricity of an object, the lesser or the lower our ability to predict its exact course and or its future course. And so for me, what's one of the things that is quite significant to understand about Elenin right now is with the extreme eccentricity that it's been dem demonstrating on its journey into our planetary neighborhood, what that kind of means for us is that uh, a lot of the models we can use, and those of you at home, you can go to NASA's JPL website and use a tool for yourself. It's a flash-based tool that lets you tinker with the solar system, and you can actually track and follow Elenin uh, forward and backward, play it like a record, record so you can see what its predicted orbit is uh, and path, its course. But once again, Dr. Agnew, and tell me if I'm wrong, when orbital, orbital eccentricity is, uh, is great, our, our ability to predict accurately is not so great. Yeah, you know, picture it like uh, a pachinko machine, a real one, not an electronic one. You drop the steel ball in the top of the game, and it strikes steel pins, which are rigid against the vertical face of the game. And depending on if the ball, you know, strikes just to the left or just to the right of one pin or another, it'll determine which one of the... Uh, of the slots it's going to follow, whether it's yes. going to fall to the bottom of the game and you lose or whether it's going to go in the hole and uh, and you're going to regain that ball. Yes. We just cannot make, at this point, because we don't have enough data points, we can't make a prediction what Elenin is going to do as it strikes each one of these gravitational fields as it comes, you know, snaking its way through our solar system. Quite right, quite right. And and I know uh, that for each one of us, our research and our understanding of Ellen is evolving with each passing day. But this is where I'd like to return to uh, what I brought up here a bit ago, that uh, Ellen is not alone as it travels through our neighborhood. Uh, maybe it's a distant cousin of Ellen, but there's another body, uh, Comet 45P Honda, that's uh, coming right around our block at about the same time. Uh, when Ellen makes its closest apparent pass in the night sky to Comet 45P Honda, uh, that will be the morning of October the 8th. And if folks had made a note uh, uh, earlier in the program, Elenin makes its closest pass to the Earth, which is 0.233 astronomical units, less than one quarter of the distance from the Earth to the Sun. 
it makes that pass closest to Earth on the 16th of October, which means that Elenin and Honda will do a little uh, do a little dance with one another, approximately eight days before Elenin is expected to make its closest path to the Earth. And Dr. Agnew, it's not just planetary bodies that can affect and change the orbit and orbital eccentricity of a comet. Another fellow comet could do it as well. Is that right? It, well, it, it could, but comets aren't going to do much. And by the way, I should make a note here that the comet 45P Honda is coming from the cometary maelstrom of of our galaxy. So it's it's coming from the predicted point of origin, which means it's more perpendicular to the plane of all the planets that that are surrounding our sun, kind of like a big dinner plate uh, with with one track missing. Um, or a big record album. So right, right. the rendezvous is going to be uh, perpendicular almost to, to one another. And, you know, that's a little bit like uh, like a torpedo uh, being launched at a ship that's going across uh, from left to right. If, if it hits it, obviously there's going to be great fireworks. If it's going to miss it one way or the other, I, I promise you that Elenin's going to have a lot more influence on 45P than 45P is going to have on Elenin. Correct. Um, but what it does, it makes the mathematics of this eccentricity so complex that I doubt uh, that astrophysical mathematicians are, are able to, to make really accurate predictions. I, I will say, though, that there's enough alarm about it on an agency, department, and administration level. Yes, yes. That very recently, I mean, in like in the last 60 days, announcements have been made from inside NASA for NASA employees and their families to build up their emergency preparedness training. And there are even grants available for NASA families to do that. That's never been done before. And Dr. Agnew, I'm, I'm so thankful that you said that because that provides the absolute perfect teaser for how we're going to spend the second half of the program, uh, which I have a sequence of about seven documents here. These are announcements, press releases, uh, and also uh, articles uh, in, in uh, 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 available on NASA.gov, also available on Space.com, which, of course, kind of handshakes closely with uh, NASA's, uh, you know, uh, information release uh, program, uh, a sequence of six or seven of these documents that they have made some very significant disclosures to the general public also. And what you've just shared with us is, is their, their own internal communications with employees. But I think the listening audience of the Crimson Pill is going to have a chance to see how those two uh, sets of things dovetail with one another. So I'm very thankful you mentioned that. Uh, I'm curious, uh, any other... <laughs> Uh, you know, extrapolation on the, the same lines. Well, I mean, it, it's one thing to to make uh, an internal memo, an email, as it were, to to NASA employees. A, we want you to get your families ready, get your extended families ready, because you never know. You know, there could be a flood, there could be a tornado, there could be, uh, you know, nuclear conflagration, like we've been talking about since the '60s. But this announcement was made in such a manner that um, it, is, it is not pointed just at NASA employees. It's actually designed to take advantage of the natural rumor mill so that NASA employees or conspiracy theorists would grab this NASA uh, a notification and spread it, make it go viral to, to the general populace. It's kind of a way of making an official government announcement without making an official government announcement. Sure, sure. I, uh, I think we're going to have an extremely stimulating conversation right throughout the second hour. But how about if I uh, join with, with your uh, disclosure about that information by pointing folks, once again, if you have another open browser, you can go to nasa.gov. I'm going to be quoting from an article that was uh, uh, released 18 of May 2011, so less than a month ago. The title of the piece is 
free-floating planets may be more common than stars. Now, when we say free-floating planets, we mean planets that are not associated with uh, a gravitational relationship with any given star, like what the Earth is with our sun, or we're in a, uh, we're in a defined orbit. These free-floating planets uh, are, are believed to be found not just in interstellar space, so that would be the regions of space that are between solar systems, but also that they make passages through solar systems themselves. Uh, Dr. Agnew, uh, any thoughts here before I, I start to uh, cite or quote just a, a couple pieces from this article? Yeah, I, uh, I did some research uh, for our first uh, three books, uh, the Ark of Millions of Years series, and there were some uh, predictions on uh, what the quantity of free-floating planets are. By the way, free-floating planets are ones that are not orbiting around another sun. These are these are planets that just sort of you know sail through space. Either their star fell apart, or some gravitational event happened, and they were pulled out of orbit, and they're just moving through space. And it was a significant number, but it was a tiny, tiny fraction of the mass of the galaxy. To have a revelation like this, that free-floating planets might be more plentiful than stars, yes. is just mind-boggling. That means Absolutely. there's a lot of trash in the form of ice-cold planets that are floating through the solar system, not associated with any sun. The reason we have that in our books is because it's, it's conclusive now that Earth, our planet, is not from this solar system. It is adopted from another galaxy, most probably the Sagittarius galaxy. Extremely interesting and quite right. And uh, as usual, you're, you're, <laughs> you're out in front of the pace of the Crimson Pill, and I absolutely dig it. I appreciate having you with us. I, I, <laughs> let, let me, let me uh, try to set the stage carefully here for a bit before we unleash all hell in the second hour, Dr. Agnew. Uh, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to begin uh, from this piece, again, dated 18 May 2011. Uh, byline, Pasadena, California. Astronomers, including a NASA-funded team member, have discovered a new class of Jupiter-sized planets floating alone in the dark of space, away from the light of a star. The discovery is based on a joint Japan-New Zealand survey that scanned the center of the Milky Way galaxy during 2006 and 2007. I'm going to pause for a moment. Folks... Think about how much time has passed since they did this, 2006, 2007. It's only just now that NASA makes this release publicly. And this release, of course, falls within the 60-day window that Dr. Agnew mentioned about the uh, discussions they've been having internally. Uh, continuing, revealing evidence for up to 10 free-floating planets, roughly the mass of Jupiter. Now, folks, that's just within the survey that they took. To imagine the range of the night sky that they were examining, if you hold up your finger and try to point at a star, that's, that's, that's almost the scale of the region of space that they examined when they found 10 of these objects that are roughly Jupiter-sized, these free-floating planets. Uh, the newfound planets are located in approximate distance blah, blah, blah. It's, that's not important because of what they're about to tell us uh, in the coming paragraphs here. The discovery indicates that there are many more free-floating Jupiter-mass planets that can't be seen. That first sentence smashes paradigms that we've held for the entire uh, uh, length of uh, the, the lifetime of NASA, but each sentence now gets progressively more fascinating. The team estimates there are about twice as many of them as stars. There are about twice as many of these free-floating planets as stars, and then our next sentence is, in addition, these worlds are thought to be at least as common as planets that orbit stars. As Dr. Agnew said, there are many, as many of these free-floating planets as there are planets that orbit stars. But we can't see these things because they're dark. We'll talk more about that in a bit. This would add up to hundreds of billions of lone planets. That's billions with a B, folks, of lone planets in our Milky Way galaxy alone. Just within our Milky Way, billions with a B of these rogue free-floating planets that we cannot see very well. In fact, we can't see very well at all. And where it goes to the next layer. These objects that are the size of Jupiter 